We want to talk about Ukraine, a number of major developments in the war in Ukraine that need our attention at this hour. And we're going to run through a few of them. And we are going to talk about nuclear weapons in a moment. But first, I think it's worth pointing out today. It's a somber anniversary. I don't know. It's always weird to call something an anniversary when it's tragic or horrible. Today, August 9th, 1945, the United States dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. Of course, this is the anniversary of that horrible day. 77 years ago, the United States dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. The first bomb dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. The second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. In the, in the one and only use of nuclear weapons in an armed conflict, the U.S. killed uh, estimates up to 225,000 people by dropping those bombs. Um, so very, very important, I think, to, to remember the absolute destruction on atomic bombs that not only and, and missed the target, by the way, but I think up to, uh, was it? It was only 10% of it was a the mile. atoms. It was that, a mile. And only 10%. Yeah, it was, a, it was about a mile. That they missed the target. So imagine if it had hit the target, how many more people would have been killed as a result of it. You know, what's interesting about this story, before we kind of get into Ukraine and, and, and Russia on this, is that only one journalist, it was an Australian journalist, was actually able to go into that area and report on it. All other journalists were kept out. They were told to not re cover the story, not release details about it. They were silenced. You know, we try to think about like the Great War, World War II, right? It's all patriotic, rah, rah. No, no, journalists were kept out of there. One journalist managed to get in there and documented the horrors. Um, of in the, Japan? In, in Japan, in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And going through and seeing the hospitals with people that are just, you know, uh, burned with radiation sickness and so forth and then died just shortly thereafter. Um, just absolute devastation. Um, again, this was totally silenced. Like it was supposed to be like, it wasn't all that bad. Just quiet. We ended the war. Meanwhile, there were already peace agreements being drawn up by Japan well before the bombs had dropped, but the United States ignored those peace agreements. You might not have known that. That's actually true. And Truman ignored those peace agreements and said, no, we're, no. why? To position ourselves against China. Did you ever read the book, A Thousand Paper Cranes? Yeah, that sounds familiar. It's about yeah. a little girl who dies from the radiation. Sorry to give that away, but um, okay. yeah, it, that's, it's a chilling book. Um, yeah, it's awful, awful. So I, I wanted to say that because I think it's an important day to remind us all like the devastation of it and atomic weapons, not even like what we have now, the nuclear weapons that we have now, but now things are ramping up and, you know, Brit, I'm really concerned about what the UK, the, uh, the language that's been coming out of the UK government. We saw this with sport with George, Boris Johnson, but we see this with senior British officials and senior British military officials who are foisting this idea that President Putin is about to like ready his nuclear weapons to attack the West. And therefore, we probably need to attack him first to prevent him from doing that. Here's a Western media piece about Putin and nuclear weapons. Vladimir Putin not scared of using nuclear weapons and could launch strike by spring 2023, says Sir Richard Barons, who is the, uh, you know, is one of the top British general, right? He's saying okay, this is a doomsday clock. Okay, but just last week, Vladimir Putin spoke at a conference and said that nobody wins in a nuclear war. Right, so. but no, 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 no. According to Britain, Britain, he's he's going to launch this by 2023, so we need to do something right now. By spring of 2023. It's incredibly specific. Yeah, like, where are you getting your information, by the way? Like, he has a date, like, on a piece of paper and hands it, like, a post-it note, like, here. And he's going to do it, by the way, if he feels like he's losing in Ukraine. Like that's what he would do if he that's according to the, the British British generals. If he feels like he's losing in Ukraine, then he's going to launch nuclear weapons. OK, think about the logistics of that for a second. Like he's going to launch nuclear weapons into Ukraine in his own backyard. That would be like us, you know, uh, I don't know, attacking Cuba or us attacking Mexico and just having that wind of radiation blowing right into the, the United States. It, it's not going to happen. Right? That would yeah. that'd be like just letting them leave Chernobyl to heal on its own. <laughs> right. Yeah, there you go. Um, and so that's one big piece of it. Now we got this other nuclear piece, which is the inspection piece. You want to talk about that? Yes. This is a huge, huge story. So now you know that we have a treaty that mutually allows the United States and Russia to inspect each other's weapons facilities. That's called the START Treaty. It was suspended 
for the last two years due to COVID restrictions, which I think is an amazing calculation that someone said, well, we can't expect inspect everyone's bombs because we might give each other COVID, right? right. So that's why we weren't that's why we weren't doing it over the last two years. We can't expect but, your nuclear weapons because we might get COVID. Right. Like the nuclear weapons would kill everybody, but we might actually spread some COVID. So that's a concern. OK, uh, now Russia is saying that it will temporarily suspend further. Hold on a second. Wait a minute. Let me just go back to that point and just hit me. Like we talk about essential workers. Right. Like, you know, think about the essential workers that people could go and get their pets shampooed. <laughs> you can't expect <laughs> but, but nuclear weapons inspectors, they're, they're not, not essential. You're not travel. essential. You're not essential travelers right now. If you need to go get your pet shampooed, that's essential. Yeah. Okay. What kind of clown show world are we living in? Right. And especially given that the government, you know, decided what was essential and what wasn't, but like, no to the, to the travel you know, for, for weapons. Like we literally can, can spend $90 billion, million dollars sending Nancy Pelosi on this trip that's highly controversial, but like maybe just a plane ticket for some weapons inspectors, too dangerous, too risky. So Russia, yeah. yeah. So Russia announced on Monday that it's gonna temporarily suspend US inspections of nuclear weapons sites. Because of these sanctions, which disallow Russian aircraft, from traveling into the United States. So Russia's saying, we can't get there. You sanctioned us, so we're not gonna participate for now. Uh, they're putting it on hold. Now, we I told you the story the other day, which was laughable the way the New York Times covered it, which is that uh, Russia took over a nuclear reactor site, okay? A nuclear power site. <laughs> right, in the chat said, could we shampoo the nukes? <laughs> yes, maybe, you gotta be, <laughs> If you could shampoo your nuclear weapons, then that would be deemed essential, I During guess. During the pandemic, you could shampoo and clip your dog's nails, but you, can't, but you yeah. couldn't inspect a weapon, so maybe you could shampoo the weapon. Yes. So uh, Russia took over a nuclear reactor site in Ukraine, okay, in the eastern section of Ukraine. Now Russia has control of it. Then suddenly, according to reports, Ukraine attacked the nuclear site. And because they have got defensive positions around it, so Ukraine attacks Russia's nuclear reactor now that they've taken it over, which has caused a problem and potential fallout could unle be unleashed as a result of this attack. Well, the way that the New York Times <laughs> covered the story was laughable, of course, because they're in the tank for Ukraine. The way that they covered it was, Russia attacks itself. Like basically Russia attacks its own reactor that it's now watching, like that makes a lot of sense. So Russia is there with its own military batteries and it's gonna to decide to attack the nuclear reactor that its troops are surrounding, mm -hmm. because that wouldn't be a problem. That makes They're zero sense. They're playing that sense. game. Do you remember when you were a kid, did you ever take a Frisbee and throw it toward the wind so that it would come back at you? So they're doing that <laughs> right. with missiles. They're shooting it up into the wind so that it comes back onto the... <laughs> it's like boomerang, like playing a boomerang. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's what they're doing, sure. So anyway, now there's concern about these nuclear reactor sites and Russia has said, hey, we are open to inspect inspections at the IAEA coming in and looking at what happened at these nuclear sites. Like we did not attack it. We're telling you, you can come look at it. We're, we're totally open to inspections. And they've repeatedly said this, like, come on in, you can come here and take a look at it. Um, so meanwhile, that's the big nuclear piece of this, right? That Britain thinks that Russia is about to launch nuclear weapons in 2023. Uh, the nuclear reactor sites is another piece of this. But of course, the new weapons package is the next big piece of this. Oh, yes, there is more weapons. Uh, so the United States now, it, it sort of comically, uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said, we're going to announce more weapons moving into Ukraine because they've been so successful with it so far. So... Um, that's interesting, right? Coming on the heels of what we reported yesterday on almost half of the military in Ukraine now is either harmed or out of commission in some in some form or fashion. Uh, but now the Washington Post is reporting that the new Ukraine military package is the largest yet. Yeah, this is the, the Pentagon. this is the largest yet. New Ukraine military package is largest yet, Pentagon says. And they were so ecstatic about it, too. I mean, it, um, uh, yesterday in the press conference, I want to play this. This is Under Secretary of Defense uh, Call, I think is his name. Um, we don't get to see him too often. Uh, everyone must be on vacation. Uh, but he was there to tell us all about how he's super excited. And hey, hey, by the way, I haven't seen you guys in the press corps for uh, a while. It's been a number of months. The last time I was here was when we had the presidential authorization number 11 
<laughs> number 11, where we didn't have to use Congress to send all of these money and weapons to Ukraine, but that was number 11. Now we're on the 18th package, and I'm super excited to be back to tell you all about it 18 times where we've continued to send weapons to Ukraine without congressional authorization, and this is our biggest one yet. Listen. I last saw you, I think, on June 1st uh, for the announcement of the 11th presidential uh, drawdown package. We are now on PDA package 18. Give it up. Uh, as we have made clear uh, at every level of this administration, we're committed to continued security assistance for Ukraine as they stand up to Russia's unprovoked and unjustified invasion. Today, uh, President Biden directed the 18th drawdown of an additional $1 billion in weapons and equipment from the Department of Defense inventories. This is the largest single drawdown of, of U.S. arms and equipment utilizing this authority to date. The package uh, provides a significant amount of additional ammunition, weapons, and equipment, the types of which the Ukrainian people are using so effectively to defend their country. So oh, effectively. So effectively, really? They're using them so effectively. <laughs> It's so funny how they always use the word too. Like the, the you can hear the propaganda, the the unprovoked, and it's like we literally provoked him. But they have to make it sound like it's not provoked. You know what I mean? Like I mean, the they pope, always they they say it the same way every time. The, yes, the the pope himself said it that NATO provoked this war. The pope himself reported this and said this. So, okay. And they, have to, yeah, they have to like work in that talking point every time they say it. It's like saying Putin's price hike. You gotta, you gotta weave it into a sentence somewhere. So his unprovoked war. Oh, you mean the eight years of of attacks? That's not provoking someone. And the extension of NATO right up to the doorstep, which was a violation of the agreement, that's not provoking anyone. Like, I don't know. Like, how many times can you like? How many times like when your little brother and little sister like keep pushing like? Don't don't do it. Don't keep flicking my ear. Don't keep. I'm telling, warning you. I don't think that's a very it's like good. Like the Bart Simpson thing. Ow! Yeah. Stop Ow. it! Stop Ow. it! Ow! Stop, stop it. it! You're gonna Ow. get punched. <laughs> and now you guys are being reductive about this. Like this was a okay, but he, I, I also think it's very insensitive for him to say that they're using this great to great effect because they are dying, right? And so to continue to send them weapons means more of them will die. Yeah, but really, are they? Um, so if you listen to the Wall Street Journal, which no, is, Ukrainians are dying. Right, right. But they're but he says they're using the weapons to great effect against the Russians. Right. Again, which sort of diminishes the people who have died because they don't know how to use these weapons, because they were not trained soldiers, because they are not getting the weapons for all these reasons that we talk about all well, the time. Well, then he's lying. I mean, he's, he's flat out lying to the American people, right? Yes. Right, flat out lying. And the Wall Street Journal is doing the same thing and lying. So they have a new report out this morning, which says as many as 80,000 Russian troops have been wounded or killed in less than six months of fighting in Ukraine, the Pentagon said on Monday. The first time the U.S. military announced its estimates of the toll of the invasion of Russia. So that's the Wall Street Journal just basically parroting exactly what the Pentagon just said. Like they run with the story because the Pentagon says, really, can you show us any proof of this? Aaron Maté would love to see some proof of this. Right. He tweets, the Pentagon didn't provide casualty estimates for Ukrainian forces. Reporters acting as stenographers for Pentagon claims about Russian casualties might ponder why that is? Another question, where are the graves and trucks for all these tens of thousands of dead Russian soldiers, right? Because those have yet to be reported. Also worth noting, he continues, the Pentagon revealed its latest estimate of 80,000 Russian casualties at the same time as it's announcing the Biden administration would give Ukraine another $1 billion worth of weapons and military equipment, one of the largest single U.S. packages of the war. Good timing, I would say. Interesting. Yeah, it's perfect timing. Then you get this new Ukraine military package is the largest yet, says the Pentagon. Um, just it's amazing how these things work in tandem, right? So the Pentagon comes out then the Wall Street Journal and the Western media just runs with it and just literally takes the, the press release that they just said and run and prints it and doesn't even question it. Like yeah. if you read through that Wall Street Journal piece, there's no questioning of this. Like, if you've got 80,000 Russians dead, wouldn't we hear about that? Where would they, yeah, where would they all go? I mean, there's plenty of Western journalists who were in that area. We would see, I mean, we would see mortuary trucks. We would see, uh, we would see cadaver trucks. We would see all of that stuff. We saw that certainly during uh, COVID and the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. With well, far and, fewer and deaths. That's and that's something that the mainstream media would probably get on board with because that helps them push their narrative. 
So sure. they would want you to see those trucks. Absolutely. They would be digging for that information, but it's not true. I mean, according to the, according to the, the reports that I've seen, it's not true at all. And according to my military sources, that's far from the truth. And in fact, we covered last night in those leaked documents. If you missed our show last night, please go back and watch the story we did all about the leaked documents coming out of Ukrainian military. The estimates are upwards of uh, you know 250,000 or more that have been ca that are casual that are casualties, killed or wounded and are totally taken out of action inside of Ukraine. So it's the exact opposite, right? So we're not going to continue to send HIMARS. That's one thing that they talked about. We're, we're going to hold back on that. We've sent 16 so far, the Pentagon says. Now, Russia says they've blown up six of them. The Pentagon is saying, no, no, we still have all of them. Really? Okay, you have all of them, but Russia is saying that six have blown up, and Western journalists uh, have also shown evidence that there are like remains of some HIMARS vehicles that have been destroyed. So we don't have an exact number here, so who knows, right? The Pentagon says none of them, they're all fine. Russia says they've blown up six of them. But we need more. But we need more. So Ukraine wants more. The Pentagon's saying we're not going to send more, but we will send ammo. We're going to send as much ammo as you need. Okay. We'll send way more ammunition for the HIMARS. And the Pentagon says they've been highly effective. Wow, like an unbelievable level of propaganda. That when is does this, um, you know, strengthen their hand for peace talks come in, right? That's what Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense, had said, that we're just trying to strengthen their hand for peace talks. Um, how about now? So nobody dies tomorrow. Yeah. Now is a good time. Yeah. What is the goalpost? Like, what is the goal? The goal is what we've heard from the Secretary of Defense is for them to retain territorial sovereignty and territorial control of the eastern part of Ukraine and Donbass, Crimea, etc. So, okay, now we're going to see, we're going to wait till Ukraine reclaims all of eastern Ukraine uh, in the Donbass region, the People's Republic. Uh, uh, the the uh, Donetsk People's Republic and down into Crimea, that's what's going to happen now? Mm. We're going to have to wait for that. But we can continue to send, you know, five, six billion dollars a week or more to Ukraine so they can continue to fight this proxy war and more people will die. Well, and for all the money that we've sent over there, couldn't we have pretty much bought every property and every piece of land in Ukraine? Like, couldn't we basically own it for the money we've sent over there? Or you know, it's funny, I, I, I was actually looking at real estate information in Ukraine. I was looking through a number of different real estate websites in Ukraine just to see like what's available and the prices and all of this. And, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. For that amount of money, you could have bought the whole country. You could have bought up like every property in, uh, you know, in Kiev. You could have bought up, you know. Now there's a talk of a big offensive that's about to unfold from Ukraine in Kyrgyzstan. So we'll see. We'll watch and see. This is supposed to be the first big offensive from the Ukrainian side in Kherson. We'll see if that actually happens and if Ukraine can reclaim that area. Uh, you know, then we'll then we'll see what the future holds.